Today's topic for our interview is REACH authorization. Thinking of the REACH authorization process might have people run shiver down their spine or have them bath in sweat. Since in the authorization process you need to provide to ROC, the Risk Assessment Committee, and SEAC, the Socio-Economic Analysis Committee, the naked truth. In our studio, properly dressed, Jeff Schatz of Thermo Fischer Scientific and Julius Waller of EPA. Gentlemen, welcome. Julius, what are the greatest practical challenges in an authorization application? Well, I think you already mentioned it, uh, Tiert. The biggest problem is that it's a multidisciplinary process. And the biggest difficulty for companies is that you need to bring together information from three or four parts of the organization. Of course, the risk uh, guys, whether it's uh, occupational health or environmental side, you need to have some of the financials for, for the economic uh, side, and you need some technical engineering R&D information for the analysis of alternatives. And particularly in large organizations, it's not necessarily very simple to draw these things together, or shall we say perhaps there are some internal politics which render this practically quite difficult. It's kind of a paradox that smaller companies have an easier time making a dossier because they're much closer to, to one another in operation than a larger one is. And I think, practically speaking, this is the biggest challenge. The dossier itself, once you have the data and you understand it, it's quite easy to put together and it's quite coherent. But bringing all the parts in, that's where the challenge is. Jeff, what strategies can a manufacturer or an importer adopt to avoid facing the market restrictions or authorization? Well, the flippant answer, of course, is simply don't use substances of very high concern. Um, but that's not always feasible or practical. Um, and in really, it's the ultimate challenge for businesses in their sustainability efforts. So the first strategy is to really know what you're making, what you're using in your op operations, whether they're on the SVHC list or if they're on the registries of intents. Furthermore, you may want to look at your chemicals that you're using in your manufacturing processes to make sure that they're, they don't carry other properties or potentially falling on the definitions under Article 57. Beyond that, you may want to, uh, manufacturers themselves may want to put internal restrictions on these substances so that you're not designing new products using these, pro uh, these substances. Importers, especially of mixtures, may want to work with their suppliers, especially their non-EU suppliers, so that they're aware of these SVHC lists and registry of intents lists. It's important that they also work to find substitutes if they want to maintain their European market. Finally, at the end of this, it's all about communication. Um, maintaining that sense of awareness of your substances, but also to tone that with the sky is not falling. Not all substances will make it to these lists. Uh, for example, or on to Annex 14, substances like the aprotic solvents recently, it's been identified that the um, uh, restriction will be the proper risk management measure for these substances. So you have to tone this in your normal communication stream, whether it be a, your quality management reviews or other systems your companies have. Talking about communication, how do you evoke a sense of urgency within your company mm -hmm. regarding authorization? Well, after going through this some t uh, for a couple times, we have a very tangible tale of the disruption to the business, the added cost, and of course uh, the ultimate customer impact as well. So we, we, we communicate this story and we sprinkle in with the facts of the matter. Authorization is not a permanent solution. Supply chains are at risk from this. And I always like to sprinkle in just a practical case study of how much does it cost to apply and redesign your products or processes versus designing correctly from the outset. Uh, this is one way we maintain this sense of urgency. Julius, when facing an authorization, what is the best time to start compiling a dossier? Well, to take a leaf from Jeff and saying, you know, the, mo the, the flip and answer is depends on you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I think we, we're the world record holder with an authorization written in a, in a week's time. Uh, I don't recommend this. Impressive. <laughs> but um, if you are going to do an authorization on your own for your own company uh, and the uses are not extremely complex, and <laughs> again, I'm looking to Jeff here, um, then a year is really ample to do it. If you're going to do it in a group format, uh, or as a producer of a substance, you should really take the maximum time and start two years ahead. Uh, anywhere uh, between six months to a year is uh, feasible, but already starting to get challenging. So it's whatever way you want to live your life. You want to be stressed and work very hard in a short uh, period, or you want to have a little bit of a more leisurely time and an ability to uh, review the dossier uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in, in a more, uh, what, what shall I call it, uh, easy process.
All parts in our cartoons have a meaning, like the mystifying mermaid taking a bath. Let's talk about endocrine disruptors. Jeff, you have experiences with different authorization processes uh, for reproductive toxins and now also for endocrine disruptors. What are the differences in these uh, processes? Well, it comes down to whether a threshold uh, level can be set. Um, with the reproductive toxins, a class 1B or 2, you may find a DNL or even a PNAC can be set. Um, with endocrine disruptors, it's uh, setting a threshold is much more controversial and challenging. Uh, eventually, you're almost certain to have to apply through the socioeconomic route. Um, making it more challenging is that a economic model for uh, the impact of an endocrine disruptor onto the environment, for example, can be extremely difficult to set. And in the end, you're always almost always going to have to demonstrate uh, no release to the environment or exposure to users of the chemicals. Um, so it becomes a very complex uh, application for something where there is a threshold, where there is a DNL, for example. Uh, it is much more straightforward. Either you have adequate control or you don't, um, even though the controls may not always be so straightforward. Yeah. So ED is the more challenging. Uh, how do you involve your uh, downstream users in this process? Involving downstream users is extremely uh, important, not only for ED, but for other uh, substances as well. Um, not only do you have to have a two-way communication with your downstream users regarding their use, but also their controls, and so that they can become aware of the controls and the risk management measures that they're going to have to Im implement upon an eventual authorization. Furthermore, they have to consider revalidation in many cases. If you've changed your process to make something relatively new or containing new substances, revalidation often requires not only a tactical partnership with that downstream users, but also sometimes third-party regulatory agencies. Uh, congratulations, sir. the use of your substance has been granted. Uh, but then what happens, Julius, if your circumstances change after the authorization has been granted? What circumstances change are you talking about, uh, Tier? Surely you've described everything in your dossier. Uh, no, you are touching upon a point which only now is becoming apparent uh, with uh, some of the authorizations that have longer review periods uh, running. Uh, Twelve years or, or even seven is a, is a long time in business. And things change. You might improve your process. Uh, there might be an external factor like Brexit uh, happening to you. Or very simple things. You want to move your production from an old site to a, a new site. Now, the REACH regulation, in its defense, has an article that covers kind of both eventualities, a review process and a change of circumstance one. The former is described, but is in fact meant to deal with the situation at the end of your authorization. The latter, unfortunately, is not described. There is no procedure for it. So right now, we're in a situation that uh, the moment you notify change of circumstance, you're opening Pandora's box. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Uh, and there are already cases where inspections have taken place that have noted, uh, well, what can argue major or minor changes of, circ changes of circumstance that have led to installations being halted. Uh, and there is no perspective on how to get them working again because there is no process to actually implement this. Uh, this is a huge lack in the, in the REACH regulation. There are uh, some ways around it, but uh, truly the best advice is don't change anything. Gentlemen, thank you very much for providing your important insights on REACH authorization processes and challenges. Sunsets can be beautiful, however, if it defines how long you can be in business, it would be better if the sand glass can be set to 15 years. And time flies, so remember, for both the market and the finished sunset sauna, authorized access only. <laughs>